Hello and welcome back into the theory zone, specifically looking at representations theories. And this is all about Elizabeth Van Zunen's feminist theory. Uh, it's one of three videos about representations of gender, uh, the other two being that of Judith Butler and Bell Hooks. Um, and if you're not familiar with those theories, it might be better to just have a look at them first, um, because it will probably help you to understand this one a little better. Um, today, obviously, we're going to try and understand the key components of Van Zunen's theory and explore how these ideas can be applied to a variety of media products uh, with the aim that you'll be able to apply them to the set media products from across the specification. But let's start with a discussion-based question. Now, traditionally, women in the mainstream media um, have functioned as objects of visual pleasure not only for the male characters within the media products but also for the viewing audience so to what extent do you think the women are still uh, function as objects of visual pleasure for both the people within the media and for us as an audience so some images there you probably expected, and maybe one that you didn't. Let's have a think of some prompts for you to consider this. Would you say that some types of media are more guilty than others when it comes to the objectification of women? Do you think modern types of media rebelling against traditional representations or are modern types of media just as guilty as the more traditional ones? Is there an increasing number of women that are taking ownership of their own representations? And are there more texts that are targeting women that fetishize female bodies as well? So have a think about these. Lots of issues to consider here. But the question for you to discuss and to answer really with some thought, to what extent is it still the case that women in mainstream media products function as objects of visual pleasure for both male characters within the text as well as for the viewing audience. I'm sure you had some really interesting thoughts about that question but it's really where Van Zunen comes in. Um, there is a theory condensed into three short paragraphs that um, for us to know for the specification of theoretical framework the first part of her ideas are that the idea that gender is constructed through discourse and that its meaning varies according to various cultural and historical contexts. Uh, the second point is that the idea that the display of women's bodies as objects to be looked at is a core element of Western patriarchal culture. And thirdly, the idea that in mainstream culture, the visual and narrative codes that are used to construct the male body as spectacle it's different from those used to objectify the female body. Well, if we look at this first point first, uh, this idea that, that gender is actually constructed through discourse and its meaning is varied according to cultural and historical context, hopefully that should have reminded you immediately of the work of Judith Butler, as this correlates with her ideas that gender is actually a societally constructed idea rather than a biologically one. And remember, she draws a distinction between gender and sex, between masculinity, femininity, and male and female. So I think we can sort of, uh, we can understand Van Zunen's first point there by understanding uh, Judith Butler's queer theory. So let's look at these second two points. The idea that the display of women's bodies as objects to be looked at is a core element of Western patriarchal culture and that the way women's bodies are represented is different to the way that men's bodies are represented. Now these notions are aspects that closely align with Laura Mulvey's theory of the male gaze in her uh, famous essay, Visual Pleasure and the Narrative Cinema. Now, it's not necessarily a theory that we study in media studies. It's certainly, if you do film studies, it's something that you will be familiar with. But for those of you who aren't aware of it, here's a quick summary of Laura Mulvey and the male gaze. So Mulvey published this article, Visual Pleasure and Narrative Cinema, in 1975. And I described it as famous really because it's, it's so well considered still holds a lot of weight um, and is kind of the backbone of a lot of uh, gender th uh, theory within um, visual arts and particularly cinema. 
The article has had a huge impact on feminist film studies, and in particular, uh, Mulvey argues that one of the pleasures of cinema is what she calls scopophilia. And this is basically a voyeuristic gaze directed at other people. In other words, one of the things we like about the cinema is people watching, but kind of in a voyeuristic way. I guess in the cinema you're in a darkened room watching people that don't know necessarily or aren't, don't draw attention to the fact that they know they're being watched. However, this is where the theory continues. Male viewers identify with the male protagonist and female characters are the subject of their desiring gaze. Well, that kind of makes sense. Uh, that we know from our study of looking at bell hooks in terms of the ratio of characters uh, in the media or representation in the media that male there is a male dominance. Um, therefore, male viewers are likely to identify with their male protagonists. And of course, what that means is that female characters are often sh um, the subject of a male character's desire. Okay. Um, However, what this ends up with is some quite interesting results. What it means is that if you're a female audience member, it means you are also compelled to take the viewpoint of the central male character. Therefore, two things happen here. First of all, it means that if you're a female audience member, quite often you are denied a viewpoint of your own, and instead you are encouraged to participate in the pleasure of men looking at women. Female characters are reduced to passive roles often, and men are often more active driving the narrative forward. Conversely, women will often become objectified, fragmented, and eroticized for both the protagonist within the narrative, but also the audience alike. So this means that we are familiar with male characters objectifying female characters within a story. Okay, desiring them, a male character is likely to desire a female character. But because we are often encouraged to take the point of view of the male character, it means that we will also be encouraged to participate in objectifying female characters. And it doesn't matter if we're male or female, we are still encouraged to objectify and desire female characters. So it doesn't matter if you're a gay male audience member or a female in the audience, you are still encouraged to desire the female characters. It's not to say you will, but you will put into that position. Let's see this in action. A great example uh, is always uh, Bond films, simply because uh, there is usually a relationship and, in, and usually a sort of sexual relationship between male and female characters in this, the lead, the hero, the protagonist, and uh, what has become known as the Bond girl, okay, with, which has its own problematic connotations. Uh, this particular clip is a good one for looking at the male gaze. It's from the 2002 film die another day. What I'd like you to do when you're watching this is to just do some simple analysis. What devices are used to objectify, fragment and sexualize the female character in this? Now remember to consider all of the different aspects where media students after all look at technical codes, that's the camera and editing, the visual codes, things like body language and mise-en-scene, as well as the narrative codes, so things like dialogue and character. Think about specifically about how we as an audience have been positioned to join in with this desiring gaze of the male, the male protagonist. And lastly, does this representation of women in film feel typical? How frequently would you say women are sexualized? Okay, let's run the clip and as I said, do some analysis of these things.
Magnificent view. It is, isn't it? Too bad it's lost on everybody else. Mojito? Uh, you should try it. Jacinta Johnson. My friends call me Jinx. My friends call me James Bond. Jinx, you say? Born on Friday the 13th. You believe in bad luck? Let's just say my relationships don't seem to last. Mm, I know the feeling. The predators usually appear at sunset. And why is that? It's when their prey comes out to drink. Too strong for you? I can learn to like it, if I have the time. How much time have you got? Until dawn. What about you? Oh, I'm just here for the birds. Hmm. Ornithologist. Ah, ornithologist, huh? Wow. Now there's a mouthful. So you're gonna be busy tonight with the owls, then, huh? No owls in Los Organos. Nothing to see till the morning. Not out there, anyway. So what do predators do when the sun goes down? They feast like there's no tomorrow. Uh, well, if you haven't seen Die Another Day and you were wondering what happens, then, uh, spoiler alert, they have sex. Um, which isn't too much of a surprise from a Bond film. But we're interested in how is this an example of the male gaze. So the devices that are used to objectify and fragment and sexualize the character. Okay, well, a lot of these feel very obvious, don't they? Of course, this character is in nothing but a bikini we see a lot of flesh and throughout the conversation between bond and jinx uh the is quite often use is a device an editing device called shot reverse shot most of the time this is in close-up so we just see the kind of uh their head and top of their shoulders but then every now and then the reverse shot of jinx cuts to a medium long shot which exposes or reveals her uh, more of her flesh, mainly her bust and her belly as well. So we see a lot of Jinx's flesh, but let's re rewind a little bit and go back to the very beginning of the scene. In fact, this scene encourages the idea of watching. Bond first sees Jinx through the pair of binoculars, which kind of implies that he can see her, but she can't see him. Immediately, there's a kind of an imbalance in the power relationship, and of course, draws attention to the voyeuristic act of watching someone who doesn't know they're being watched. Jinx emerges from the water, um, but initially we don't even see her face. As a representation of women, she's reduced to little more than a body, because I don't know if you noticed, she's backlit by the sun, so all we see is the, her silhouette as she emerges from the water. There's something else about this shot as well, which is interesting. Um, and again, it's edited in shot reverse shot, so that we see Bond looking through the binoculars, watching Jinx, cut with her emerging from the water and walking her way to the shore. But there's also something very unusual about this, um, which you may have noticed. Uh, we are encouraged to look at Jinx for longer than a normal period of time, as Jinx is framed and shot in slow motion. So that means that we've got Bond in real time, cross-cutting with Jinx in slow motion, a complete departure from reality, but one which enforces us as an audience member to look and to objectify her body for longer than is would be natural. She takes longer to walk from the water than she would uh, had it not been slowed down. So there's all kinds of um, technical aspects that are going on here. Uh, there's all kind of... Um, visual aspects that are going on here um, and of course this combines with the narrative the cheesy dialogue with lots of innuendo and references to predators and 
pray um one particularly um i suppose kind of uh, uh, almost feels like something out of a farce where bond describes himself as an ornithologist bird watching and then um Jinx describes that as quite a mouthful. You'll have to watch again to see where she's looking when she says that. But the scene is full of innuendo. It's full of uh, sexual connotations. But more interestingly, as an audience member, we are encouraged very much to take Bond's position, to take his point of view. He's our hero. He's the protagonist. And we're encouraged to uh, objectify her just as much as he's doing so. We participate in that desiring gaze. Now, the question was, does this representation of women in film feel typical? How frequently would you say that women are sexualized? And I'm sure probably the answer was quite a lot. Here's just some statistics from between 2007 and 2012, so not an age away, probably within the same era of Hollywood that we're kind of in, I guess. The first one, um, and this will remind you of some of the kind of statistics that we looked at in the bell hooks lesson um this first one is uh, only 30.8 percent of speaking characters in film uh, are women now occasionally i will get someone who says well that's not too bad isn't it um you know that's that's 30 uh, percent is quite a lot well if you consider that half of the planet's population are women so 50 percent then that seems to be quite a strange statistic, doesn't it? Okay, so of these women, okay, uh, how many women in film are wearing sexually revealing clothing? 28.8%, all right? So more than a quarter of women who appear on screen will be in some kind of sexually revealing clothes. And again, occasionally someone might say, well, that's not as many as I thought would be. Uh, however, you've got to consider that this is in the top 500 films. And so some of these films will include, I guess, uh, dramatic um, family dramas. They will include children's films. They will include um, uh, movies that are about social issues. And yet more than a quarter of women in these films are wear sexually revealing clothes. And actually, if you compare it so the percentage of men wearing sexually revealing clothes is more than four times the amount of men. Uh, sorry, more than four times uh, the, the amount of women are wearing sexually revealing clothing compared to the male counterparts. Likewise, how many? Um, what percentage of women uh, are partially naked in movies? Uh, more than quarter again, 26.2%. And again, this compares to 9.4% uh, of men will be partially naked in a movie. And then overall, how the percentage of movies which featured a balanced cast, where half of the characters are female, only 10.7%. Okay, So there is a massive inequality in movies. And of course, all of these ideas reinforce that idea that Van Zunen says that, or this notion that female objectification is actually a key part or key aspect of what she describes as a patriarchal culture. And again, we looked at this with Bell Hooks. What do we mean by patriarchal culture? Um, in the Bell Hooks session, we looked a lot more at kind of representation, um, not only within the media, but in other aspects of life as well. But if we stick with film just for the moment, um, we can see that even in more recent movies, going up to as close recently as 2016, which is only five years ago, I guess, um, the prevalence of female speaking characters across 900 films and percentages always seem to be hovering around that 30% mark, okay? Things haven't necessarily changed. That uh, Maybe that's a slight shift forwards with that percentage of films with a balanced cast, 12%. Um, but the ratio of males to females is still 2.3 males to 1 female. And last time I checked, the ratio of males to females on planet Earth, uh, 1 to 1. So there is a huge imbalance uh, within these films, which leads to that kind of objectification and sexualization. So there's a little activity to kind of consolidate this first point about uh, these first points about Van Zoon and makes. Uh, I'd like you to pick a type of media from the following list: uh, advertising, magazines, newspapers, music video, TV or film, specifically film marketing, so trailers, posters, and whatnot. So I want you to use this opportunity to explore the notion that men act 
and women appear, that females often occupy passive roles in media texts and men will take on more active roles, often responsible for perhaps driving narratives forward. Okay, so what you need to explore and to maybe even research if you can't think of any off the top of your head are some specific examples from the medium that you choose that reinforce these ideas. So a little hint here, it might be worth considering some of the archetypes that women often inhabit within narrative texts or even that they inhabit in uh, non-narrative texts. Within this course, we've already looked at some of those. For example, the 1950s housewife in the Tide advert, uh, just as an example. Um, but have a think, write down some examples, do some research if you need to. Now, there are obviously some texts which reverse this idea um, and have female characters which are far more active within a narrative who will actually take control of a text. Um, so, with, look, thinking about the same medium, can you name any? Can you think of any uh, characters or examples where, um, where there is actually a more progressive representation of women? And in your opinion, do you think that some types of media are actually more progressive when it comes to representations of women than others? Well, for that last question, I'm fairly willing to bet that no one actually said that advertising was a medium that was more progressive than others. Uh, in fact, advertising is a really good medium for us to look at when considering Van Zunen's ideas. I've just picked four adverts here. Uh, they do have something in common uh, other than their objectification in women, but I'll get to that later. Um, but as you can see from these adverts, uh, there's a lot of uh, flesh on show. Uh, there's a lot of objectification on show. Um, and there's even voyeurism as well. And the reason, the other thing that they have in common is that they are all for cameras, which is particularly interesting because they're promoting products that emphasize the act of looking. You know, the, the purpose of a camera is to capture a moment and to look at something or it's, it's a purely visual medium. But what's fascinating is how they use this opportunity to encourage a really specific way of looking at women, namely a way in which we as an audience are encouraged to see women as objects of sexual gratification or wish fulfillment. Sometimes we look at them looking at us, sometimes we see others watching them, or sometimes we see them looking at themselves or each other. Uh, interestingly, um, in two of these pictures, the actual faces of the women are obscured, so they're fragmented. These women don't even have faces. We're aware of their uh, behinds, we're aware of their busts uh, or their cleavage, uh, but we, we don't actually see their faces. Um, and like I said, sometimes the balance of power is that we they don't even know that we're looking or they are aware that other peop people are looking. The creepiest one of all, I guess, is that, and it's quite a hard thing to be the creepiest one in these four photos, but uh, the creepiest advert is obviously the Nikon advert. don't know if you realise, but one of the features of the camera they're promoting there is the facial recognition um, uh, pos uh, capabilities of the camera. Uh, and it's not just the two faces of the incredibly young looking girls on the, the the shot but also that there are a number of people in the windows of the flats behind and also someone behind the curtain a uh, really quite a disturbing and as i said quite creepy advert um but whatever it is there always seems to be an imbalance of power where the audience us is given a privileged position over the models within these images now we can do analysis of women within uh, images and advertising. Uh, you know, it's something that's been done, I guess, time immemorial. But what's perhaps another aspect of Van Zunen's theory, as well as Mulvey's male gaze, is that representations are actually a symptom of patriarchal culture or a patriarchy. Now, obviously, this is a bit harder to prove just from analysing uh, images. We could, you know, we could uh, analyse a lot of sexually explicit or objectified images, and that, that wouldn't necessarily tell us definitely that this is a product of a male-dominated industry or culture. 
However, it doesn't actually require a huge amount of exploration or research into the advertising industry to discover just how male-dominated it is. And as with luck, uh, we the controversy over the production of an ad campaign for Nikon cameras, of all people, uh, actually helps us with discovering this. Uh, so what you can see there, that image, was um, Nikon uh, making a promotion. They were trying to promote one of their new cameras, the D850. And so what they decided to do was to enlist a plethora of photographers to go and use this new camera, uh, professional photographers, to use their new camera to, uh, to, to as part of the promotion. Okay, And of the 32 photographers that they asked to uh, test drive this camera as a way of pr promoting it uh, absolutely none of them were women okay now does this mean that there are no women photographers in the world of course it is it doesn't okay does it mean that ma male photographers are just naturally better at photography than women well of course it doesn't okay it means there is a systemic problem within uh, the advertising industry when it comes to promotion and so on okay um this story might seem ridiculous and cherry-picked and over the top um or just maybe a, a, an outlier and an anomaly uh, but actually it does completely reflect trends within the advertising industry not just within representations in the media so just we're going to take a quick moment to go ahead and look at how this is a indicative of the industry the very top part here is a, an article from the guardian from past couple of years in the advertising industry however there are very few female creative directors making the adverts that women see in 2008 just 3.6 percent of the world's creative directors were female since then it's tripled to 11 percent in london my research shows the figure at about 14 percent still shockingly low Okay, so just put this into a bit of perspective, okay, we're talking about creative directors in advertising agencies, right, this is a job that even if you believe that there are some jobs which um, are gender specific, okay, that maybe men do better than women or women do the better than men, and I don't think there are many people who still feel that, but even if you were to believe that, we're still talking about a job which doesn't have that you know we're talking about people who are uh, uh, creative directors and yet just recent statistics show that in the world only 11 percent of creative directors are women compared to men so that shows a complete lack of parity within advertising and industry so are we surprised that we see so many sexualized representations of women on our screens on our billboards and so on just to back this up, this is a rather disturbing article from Campaign, which is an advertising industry magazine that explains some of these issues in a little bit more depth. So here's the article. This is from 2018, so not far, uh, not long ago at all. We all know the statistics show an underrepresentation of women in the creative departments of advertising agency, particularly as creative directors. Indeed, IPA research shows that 89% of creative directors in the UK are men. However, I was curious to learn that when we looked at the gender split of graduates from the creative courses that train people for these roles, such as advertising, art and design, higher education courses, it's actually biased towards women, with 61.7% of graduates are female. There are more young women training for roles in creative departments than men by quite a long way. Encouraging, right? Wrong. My study showed that, shockingly, we're losing up to 50% of our qualified female talent between education and permanent roles in advertising agency creative departments. These are the lost girls. So where do the lost girls go? Quantitative analysis of my students at Southampton Solent over the last six years shows that they were gaining roles in agencies, but just not as creatives. Whilst only 11% of female graduates went into creative departments, less than half of the proportion of their male peers, 45% went into other agency roles and 34% gained roles in marketing and other creative companies. This ref is reflected in IPA figures that show an overwhelming majority of entry-level account managers are women. In short, these girls were becoming account managers, planners and project managers, but not creatives, despite training specifically for that role. 
Now, of course, this article explains how, despite a growing number of women having the opportunity to select to train in the creative sector and actually outnumbering their male colleagues when they're in education, doing art and design and graphics and so on like that, there is only really a very few that will end up in the job that they're training for, that will end up in that role that when they decided to go to university, that what they were aiming for. Of course, what this means is they're not less skilled to be a creative director than a man. They're not less equipped to be a creative director than a man uh, or succeeding in the creative aspects of the industry. The article suggests that there are a number of institutional and structural barrels that limit women's progress. And if you cast your memory back to when we were talking about uh, bell hooks and uh, uh, patriarchal institutions, not just political ones, but within industry and business, uh, then that might help to understand some of this. So the other thing we have to, of course, consider is that are women taken less seriously within the industry because they are considered to be nothing more than objects or reduced to some very simple signifiers? So this is kind of the chicken and egg situation. What came first? The chicken the structural barriers, or the egg, limited representations of women. So, what would you say are the institutional or the structural barriers that stop women from progressing within creative industries? So, using the information from the campaign article, as well as your own ideas, have a think about this. What do you think might be within institutions, advertising agencies, that are stopping women from getting to those top jobs? Now, you've probably seen this before, but watch Cynthia Nixon narrate the blogger Camille Rainville's Be A Lady. And how does the film highlight the contradictory women messages that women and girls have to grow up listening to? And how does the media contribute to these problems? Be a lady, they said. Your skirt is too short. Your shirt is too low. Don't show so much skin. Cover up. Leave something to the imagination. Don't be a temptress. Men can't control themselves. Men have needs. Look sexy. Look hot. Don't be so provocative. You're asking for it. Wear black. Wear heels. You're too dressed up. You're too dressed down. You look like you've let yourself go. Be a lady, they said. Don't be too fat. Don't be too thin. Eat up. Slim down. Stop eating so much. Order a salad. Don't eat carbs. Skip dessert. Go on a diet. God, you look like a skeleton. Why don't you just eat? You look emaciated, you look sick. Men like women with some meat on their bones. Be a size zero, be a double zero, be nothing. Be less than nothing. Be a lady, they said. Remove your body hair. Bleach this, bleach that, eradicate your scars, cover your stretch marks, plump your lips, Botox your wrinkles, lift your face, tuck your tummy, perk up your boobs. Look natural, you're trying too hard, you look overdone. Men don't like girls who try too hard. Be a lady, they said. Wear makeup, highlight your cheekbones, line your lids, fill in your brows, lengthen your lashes, color your lips, powder, blush, bronze, highlight. Your hair is too short, dye your hair, not blue. That looks unnatural. Look young, old is ugly. Men don't like ugly. Be a lady, they said. Save yourself, be pure, don't be a whore, don't sleep around. Men don't like sluts. Don't be a prude. Don't be so uptight. And smile more. Pleasure men. Be experienced. Be sexual. Be innocent. Be dirty. Be the cool girl. Don't be like the other girls. Be a lady, they said. Don't talk too loud. Don't talk too much. Don't be intimidating. Why are you so miserable? Don't be a bitch. Don't be so bossy. Don't be so emotional. Don't cry. Don't yell. Don't swear. Endure the pain. Don't complain. Fold his clothes, cook his dinner, keep him happy. That's a woman's job. You'll make a good wife someday. Take his last name. You hyphenated your name. Crazy feminist. Give him children. You don't want children? You will someday. He'll change your mind. Be a lady, they said. Don't get raped. Don't drink too much. Don't walk alone. Don't go out too late. Don't dress like that. Don't get drunk. Don't smile at strangers. Don't go out at night. Don't trust anyone. Don't say yes. Don't say no. Just be a lady.
So there we go, Cynthia Nixon narrating the Camille Rainville blog, Be a Lady. Um, and so the question there is really about whether the representations of women are in part uh, causing the sort of um, maybe a part, part of the reason why women aren't taken more seriously within the creative industries themselves uh, behind the camera as it were okay or whether these structural problems and the institutional barriers that stop women from getting to uh, creative directive level means that we're stuck in a kind of feedback loop where women will always be represented in the way that they are so some more examples of advertising, okay, which, um, again, quite extreme stuff, um, maybe quite shocking. All three of these adverts are definitely um, quite extreme in their sexualization of women. Uh, one of them was banned. I think what's most disturbing is that it's quite difficult to be sure exactly which one was banned, but they were all made, um, which is uh, significant, I think. Now, there is a counter-argument, of course, to Van Zunen's ideas and, and Mulvey's male gaze, is that, is there an existence of a female gaze? And is there a, sub a sexualization and objectification of men? Well, undeniably, this does exist. And we will discuss this further as a later part of Van Zunen's theory. Um, but it's important to consider the nature of the gaze when it comes to women, not just that they are being sexualized. And the reason I've picked these three adverts is because these are... Again, extreme examples, but they are examples of how it's not just about objectification or fragmentation of women, but it's about the imbalance of power, as we've mentioned before. Just think how frequently are the audience encouraged to see women as submissive, for example, or exploiting their vulnerability, um, or fragmenting them. In other words, literally dividing them up into pieces. Um being dominated, usually by men, being much younger, okay, or represented as being much younger, or even in the case of the Dolce & Gabbana advert, being outnumbered, uh, which is obviously quite horrific, and uh, it's quite, you know, that, that Dolce & Gabbana advert is um, really quite extreme, particularly disturbing is how it positions, uh, all three of them position us as an audience member, as within the room that's there um the jbs advert um p positions us as voyeuristically spying spying on a naked woman on the toilet the american apparel we are looming above uh, the young girl on the sofa um and then in the three shots above her uh, seemingly in bed and then in the Dolce and Gabbana advert we are voyeuristically positioned as potentially one of the onlookers or attackers um now, uh, you probably won't be surprised to hear that it was the Dolce & Gabbana advert that was banned. Uh, but all three of these represent that idea that there is an imbalance of power um, and that um, th that as the audience is encouraged to um, take sort of control within a situation. But let's look at the idea that there might be a changing tide with advertising. Um, this advert for weight loss products was on billboards and emblazoned on public transport. Um, and I know that some of you will have un uh, almost certainly have seen this before. Um, but it was eventually banned. Okay. Um, I think, again, there's a kind of either or here. What tells us more about the objectification in modern media, in 21st century modern media? Is it more significant that there was a campaign from the public to have this removed and it being subsequently banned, that we're angry about this kind of thing, that we do reject these kind of representations of women um, being reduced to little more than a beach body or that there is a ideal template of women being represented or the fact that it was produced in the first place. Does it actually tell us something about modern media to say, well, actually, people still believe that they can make adverts like this, uh, regardless of backlash? To give you the full story on this, in autumn 2018, the regulatory body in charge of advertising, the ASA, announced that it would ban any adverts that used 
harmful gender stereotypes. So they've made it clear uh, that using such stereotypes, even in a humorous way, will not be a defense. You cannot use gender stereotypes in advertising anymore. Anything that perpetuates limiting stereotypical ideologies about what it means to be a man or a woman, a boy or a girl, will not be passed by the ASA. However, if an advert uses humour to mock or satirise the notion of stereotypes, then that will be acceptable. So you can, can, you can sort of mock existing stereotypes of men and women to, kind of, to, uh, to try and challenge stereotyping itself. Uh, but the ban will not cover the representation of people as successful, attractive or glamorous. However, concerns grow over their relationship with the media and psychological issues surrounding body image. So, in other words, there's a lot of good been done recently to try and counteract the stereotyping within advertising. Um, however, this particular advert wasn't banned for the grounds of uh, creating a kind of... a perfect vision or version of a woman and perpetuating that women have to have some, uh, uh, a body image it was actually banned because of the claims it made about the protein powder it was selling so let's consider this idea of representations of men that we alluded to earlier you know uh, this first image is a poster created by an artist that um, compiles images for the uh, something called the Hawkeye initiative which asks the question what if the male characters in modern media were posed or made to look like the female characters and often with sort of comic uh, but very satirical uh, consequences so van zunen develops her argument to suggest that the way a man's body is represented is completely different to how a woman's body is represented according to van zunen the male body avoids the same kind of eroticization that is used to represent women now, that's not to say that the male body isn't necessarily fetishized or fragmented in its depiction within the media. But as before, a look at advertising can provide some interesting case studies to test the various hypotheses, as well as some of the ideologies surrounding representations of men. So for that, we're kind of going to just take a moment to return to uh, hegemony, mythologies, women and men. Thinking back to the video for Be A Lady, they said, it obviously throws the spotlight onto a number of conflicting ideological messages that the media sends to female audiences. And of course, one way it does that is to demonstrate the numerous hypocritical and constructive representations of women that appear in the media. So many of those representations in that uh, short film are women in the media. It shows that the notion of the perfect template of femininity is a creation of the media and it's almost impossible to achieve because it's so contradictory. Now many of these rep ideologies surrounding women in the media are often represented as simply accepted, unquestioned. In this way the representations are what we call hegemonic or what Roland Barthes would describe as a series of mythologies which if you remember we discussed when we looked at Stuart Hall's constructive, uh, constructionist idea of uh, representation but the media doesn't just feed us a series of myths about women it also tells us what it means to be a real man so what mythologies are we told in the media about what it means to be a man how does the media construct a hegemonic version of masculinity that we're expected to just take for granted let's look at a couple of examples here this is a very famous advert for Nike from about 2004, 2003, around then. Analyse the advert. Consider the symbolic codes and the intertextuality. The advert was controversial. Why do you think it caused such discussion? And what mythologies or ideologies does it tell us about men and masculinity? Well, obviously... Uh, there is a lot going on with this advert, okay, um, and it was controversial for a number of reasons, I suppose. One of them is the aggressive facial expression, the almost sort of primal scream that Wayne Rooney has on his face, um, which, uh, and the St. George's uh, cross painted on his sort of white body with the white background. Now, some of these saw this as connotations of violence and blood, OK, um, that this is uh, maybe harking back to an era of hooliganism uh, f with British football, um, which 
we try to leave behind that uh, sport is something that shouldn't be associated with violence uh, but here is you know the look on Rooney's face is one of uh, uncontrolled um, passion and as I said before almost kind of anger as he celebrates potentially what is a goal but also just as likely could be uh, the you know the, the conqueror in a physical fight um, intertextual re- references well um, if you know the movie Braveheart which is a kind of a Mel Gibson film about a Scottish um, uh, warrior um, who had blue paint daubed on his face and his body there's almost kind of reference to that but maybe slightly more controversial is the kind of Christ-like pose uh, that Rooney adopts here arms spread out as if on the cross um, which at the time I'm sure Nike would have argued that perhaps uh, Rooney was seen as the sort of saviour of the national England national football team uh, but of course it's quite offensive if you have uh, strong Christian beliefs um, but more than anything this tells us The ideologies about men and masculinity is that men are aggressive and competitive, that they're passionate, um, but then possibly also violent as well. Now, as I said, according to Van Zunen, the male body avoids the same kind of eroticization that is used to represent women. But is this actually still true? Or are we living in an era where both male and female bodies are fetishised, eroticised, objectified and sexualised? After all, men's bodies have always been represented in art, print and on screen. Is our fascination with the male form really any different from our preoccupation with women's bodies? Just a few images from uh, masculine uh, male physicality that's been represented in cinema really since the 1960s there. But we know that advertising is our go-to place for this. And certainly aftershave and underwear adverts provide us the best opportunity to analyse the notion of a female gaze. Bodies are fetishised and fragmented. But are we encouraged to look at them differently from how we're positioned to look at women's bodies? I suppose the best way is to make a direct contrast with how these men who are clearly objectified they're fetishized their bodies are seen as uh, perfect we are encouraged to look at them but is there a difference between the way that we are encouraged to look at them or the way that perhaps they're looking at us because whilst it seems clear that in advertising at least there is just as much eroticization and sexualization of the male form as there is the female There is a distinct difference in the power balance that is being represented here. To be a sexualized man means to still be dominant and to be in control of the gaze. Definitely the subject of a desiring gaze, but rarely the subject of a voyeuristic one. However, to be a woman is still to be sexually available, but also to be dominated and watched, even if she doesn't know she's being watched, even in the most vulnerable situations. So a couple of examples here again, one from the Hawkeye Initiative about the differences about the way men and women are often dressed in uh, superhero films in particular. And then on the left hand side there, uh, the differences in marketing, we've already seen one uh, American apparel advert here, but on the left hand side you've got a column of different garments uh, being marketed um, by American apparel using female models and on the right by male models and you can see a clear difference in the way that they use their female models uh, to how they use their male models but do you know what things are changing slowly the internet is actually a great place to find people who are keeping checks and balances in place like the two viral images above Uh, you know people are calling out the advertising agencies on this people are calling out the movies on their sexualized and sexist representations However, despite differences in representation of power and context, is there still a cause for concern over the objectification of men? Read the article from the conversation.com website and make notes on some of the issues and the problems that comes with male objectification. So there's a final thought here. We may, well, talk about 
sexualized representations and objectification of men and women across the media. But actually, uh, are we are contributing to the problem ourselves in this era. Are we doing it to ourselves? Has social media and self-representation contributed to the objectification of ourselves? When the majority of the photos online are actually of ourselves, with little context of what we're doing and where we are and who we are, are we actually guilty of objectifying us? Is being in control more empowering for people? Is it dangerous for audiences to objectify themselves? Does their own self-objectification reinforce certain ideologies? Can you relate this to any other theories that we've looked at so far within the media? And finally, once you've thought about these questions and tried to give whatever answers you can, please remember these are entirely opinion-based ideas. Read the article on social media and body image and see what you think. Well, thanks very much, folks. Uh, I've left you with a whole bunch of questions that are really tricky to answer, but of course they are, as I said, just opinion-based. I think if we are going to talk so much about objectification in the media of both men and women, we also must consider the fact that we are now living in an era where we are taking photos ourselves. We have become the encoders, but where have we learned to take these photos from? What are our uh, what are our role models, if you like? Uh, what, what, what inspiration do we take and where does it come from? And does that mean that we're living in an era where we're actually likely to perhaps objectify ourselves in some ways? As I said, thanks again for, for listening. Hope this all made sense and see you again in the Theory Zone.